Okay. So we are recording. Thank you all again for joining me today. Um, I'm going to let you know exactly how we're going to get down. I'm going to start with an introduction, tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about this workshop, the goals for this workshop, and it is a part of a three event series. So I hope that you will also join me later on this month. I also want to get to know you. So please, if at any point you want to turn your camera on, if you decide that you actually want to turn your audio on and not just write in the chat, I'd love to hear from you as well. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about writing as a form of resistance. We are tuned in for Caribbean American Heritage Month. And so for me, that means talking about the poetries of Caribbean people across the diaspora. And a lot of the times when we're looking at these poetries that are centered um, in places across the world, when we're looking at marginalized groups of people, we are talking about creativity as a form of resistance. So I want to make sure that we have a short discussion about that and then look at a poem by the one and only Grace Nichols. Um, I'll introduce her to you guys later on. She is a Guyanese poet, um, which is befitting for this event. And don't worry, this is only an introductory workshop. So if you feel like I'm moving too slow, please just jump in and, and let me know if I should pick up the pace. Um, I'd love for us to talk a little bit about the poem that I have as an example and make sure that we have time to write and share our own work. I hope that works for everyone, I'm so excited. So firstly, I am Carmen Wong. For those of you who do not know me, um, I graduated with my MFA in creative writing poetry in December. I am starting a PhD program <laughs> in the fall. And really, I'm interested in looking at Black arts. I'm interested in researching um, literature of the non-Western world. Um, and so for me, that's inclusive to African-American literature as well as um, Caribbean literature um, and African literature as well. Um, I got a grant from Poets and Writers New Orleans um, basically to put on, or I'll say I, I pitched an event series um, that really just celebrates the voices of our people. Um, and for me, I really wanted to make sure that I indicated that um, it's about expression, right? It's about artistic expression, it's about um, intelligence. Um, when I was putting together this uh, proposal to, to put on a grant, um, immediately I thought about this construct, this Western construct where we don't turn to areas outside of the Western hemisphere. Um, outside of the Western world, that means lower um, than the equator. We're talking about, you know, places in South America, we're talking about different continents such as Africa that we don't look to, um, to engage in intellectual conversation. And so for me, as someone who was born in Guyana, I was born in Guyana and raised in New York. Um, it's about rewriting that narrative um, to dispelling those, uh, those myths that the Caribbean is not a place to turn to um, in terms of artistry, in terms of culture, or in terms of intelligence. And so I decided to put on this workshop um, called Poems of Possibility, because I think when we look at the writings of Caribbean people in general and people across um, the larger African diaspora, um, we are also thinking about the writings and the artistry of people who believed um, and we're not just talking about um, this myth that we see in newspapers and in the media um, about us causing havoc and, and wanting to loot and do all these things. No, we have created our artistry from a place of love, um, from a place of concern, um, from a place of care. And so for me, it's about talking about those possibilities that our ancestors saw in order for us to be here and deliver our truths today. Okay, so. I just wanted to let you know a little bit about what's going on um, and, and really make sure that we are censoring the voices um, of Caribbean people. And so that's why I chose the poet for our example today. Um, now, what I wanna ask is for you guys <laughs> to introduce yourselves. I know that I know some of you, but please, I want to hear from you. If you are not familiar with any Caribbean poets, that's completely fine. I just kind of want us to talk to each other and feel comfortable in this setting as we go into intimately expressing ourselves through our writing. I guess I'll go first. Um, my name is Charles. Um, I'm based in Virginia right now. Uh, I don't have a favorite Caribbean poet. 
I just love poetry. Um, it's something I do in my off time. I'm an IT by trade. Um, and I just hope to learn just a little bit of everyone's art, art form and just how they express themselves. So that's it. Hi, Charles. Thank you for joining us. Oh my goodness. First of all, I have to ask, how did you hear about this workshop? I heard about it from um, I um, on Instagram. Oh, yeah, she... great. Yeah, shout out to I. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for joining us. Would anyone else like to, and you don't have to turn your camera on, but I do appreciate you turning your camera on, Charles. If anyone else would like to jump in and just say anything that you know or um, like about poetry. I know, Charles, you said that you just like to do it in your spare time, um, but I'd like to hear a little bit even from you about what forms um, you either like or do you pay attention to or what are the things that attract you to poetry in the first place? I would just say it's just an outlet um, when I'm stressed or uh, just feeling um, good, bad, um, whatever it may be, just a form of expression, honestly. Um, there's no specific type of uh, poetry I like. Um, I just free write. I appreciate that. Thank you. And the reason why I do ask that is because I want it to, to be known that this is a space for us to talk about poetry um, not just in the written technique, right? But also thinking about it orally. So some of the things that I know attracts me to poetry is the way that things can sonically sound, right? Um, listening even to that alliteration or sometimes when you're in the presence of performers and you hear that pastoral, um, you know, um, fragrance that hits us and we're also like, compelled to leave our seats and to, to maybe like make noises of our own. I, I'm very interested in hearing what it is that you guys um, fashion about poetry. Anyone else that's tuned in, checking in with everyone? I'll go next. Um, hey, hi. Swiss. Hey, Carmen. <laughs> so I'm Swiss. Um, I just graduated out of my MFA program at UNO as well, getting my master's in creative writing with a concentration in poetry. Um, right now I'm in Jersey. I don't have a favorite Caribbean poet. Um, I have to say that I'm a little ignorant to Caribbean poets. Um, and so that is something that I hope to learn today, but not only just today, in the future as well, uh, because I do think that that is an area of poetry that I would like to learn more about um and yeah thanks for sharing swiss would you like to talk to us really briefly about what your poetic style is how would you describe it uh i would describe it as heavy um on the oral and sonic aspect of poetry uh, even in its written form you can hear it um and that's one thing that I love about poetry in general, uh, I'm a spoken word artist by trade. Uh, and so the oral and aural uh, aspect of poetry is what I lean into heavy with my own poetic style. I'm so happy that you mentioned that you are a spoken word poet, right? Um, because oftentimes when we think about this um, genre of writing, sometimes it gets mistakenly put into this box that it can only be literary if we can write it down, right? Um, and I think that it's important when we talk about literatures, especially literatures um, and poetry of the Caribbean that we're also thinking about very oral people we're thinking about people who like to tell stories that like to tell um, folklores, right? Things that are passed down to the presence of your tongue. Um, I see one more person that's joining us today. Would you like to talk about, um, to introduce yourself and talk about uh, poetry, your poetic style or anything that you like to add to the conversation? And please don't feel the need to, if, if at any point you don't wanna talk, I'm not forcing anyone to talk, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I'll definitely go next. Um, so my name is Kyra Fox. It's up as um, Fox on here. Um, I am also a poet, kind of just a writer, an artist, um, someone who likes to express themselves in different forms of art. So if that means poet today, then awesome. Um, and just like um, 
other people share just having poetry um, as an outlet and just a way to express yourselves um, through words, through sounds, um, and just what that means to the world. And I'm excited to tune in um, to this to really just see what that means to the Caribbean American world and what those um, what that art looks like and what story that art tells. Um, so I'm really excited to um, sit along for that. Thanks, Kyra. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, really, every time I host a workshop, and a lot of it has been virtual, as many of you know, um, I just like to make sure that we have some kind of um, competency and how we run these uh, virtual workshops. And all I ask is that we be respectful, that we keep this a very safe space. And I know sometimes that's such a a gutter word like we just say it and people don't know what that means right because we have all kinds of people that like to enter the virtual realm and present themselves in any kinds of way all i ask is that we each contribute to the discussion um quite frankly i do prefer very intimate workshop settings so i i'm happy that it's four of us really um and and what i ask is that you know we come here being fearless um, in the sense that we can be ourselves, um, in the sense that we can commend others, that we can listen to, to each other, and that we can ask questions for things that we really don't understand or things that we want to learn more about. Um, I have been writing for a really long time, um, and I have been published uh, for a few years, but I am in no way um, some kind of know-it-all, do-it-all person. I want us all to be involved, um, and I like us all to ask questions to each other. I don't want this to be some kind of hierarchical structure in that um, everything is leaned towards me because I think that I am in this room, in this virtual room with very brilliant people who have their own understanding and love and commitment to poetry as well. And so I wanna make that very clear. Okay, so let's start off with talking about writing as a form of resistance, right? So when we think about resistance, I want us to think a lot about um, the refusal to accept or comply with something um, that is seemed as structured or as the norm, right? Um, and so easily when we talk about resistance, um, it's not something that is very popularized in mainstream media. Um, and therefore, when we look at literatures of resistance, it's not something that is popularized um, in this canon of literature either, right? Um, a close example would be all the things that we have seen um, in what I like to call the resurgence um, of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Um, in the ways that the media has shaped um, Black people's resistance um, as a story of <laughs> less about triumph, right, but, but more about violence. Um, and so when we think about our understanding of resistance, we're thinking about a reaction to something, right? Um, I want us to also think about this idea of spiritual resistance, right? And so when we talk about that, I want you to know that I'm referring to attempts by individuals um, to maintain their humanity, right? If there is anything that I can get you to understand about this this large word resistance, right? Is to think about the ways um, in which individuals try to maintain their humanity, personal um, integrity and their dignities, right? Which has to mean that at some point it was stripped from them, okay? And so when we're thinking about writing as a form of resistance, we're talking about humanizing us, right? We're talking about making sure that we can get our stories to the forefront, right? And that just means in a circle like this, that could also mean in bookstores. But what that means is that our stories are coming out of ourselves, right? Out of our chest, out of our bellies, they're coming out of us and they're, re they're being reproduced, whether it's on the page or on the stage or wherever. And so when we talk about these um, things that become these forms of resistance. We're also thinking about things that give us hope, right? Things that allow us to envision possibility. Um, and so that's why I decided to entitle this workshop uh, Poems of Possibility, because what I want us to do is think about the ways in which Caribbean writers and even ourselves um, imagine the future, right? Whether that is a future that is COVID free, or whether that is a future um, that is equitable, right? 
I know these are large things to think about. I think that Swiss um, said it very well in, in talking about the heaviness, the weight of this all, right? Um, and the ways that it's reproduced when people hear it, the heaviness um, um, from our voices and the strains in it that, that ultimately cause an effect, right? Um, and so that's ultimately what we're talking about when we're thinking about poems of resistance, when we're thinking about why Caribbean writers um, often write from a place of resistance, where their poetry has, has been founded, right? And so in order to even talk about Caribbean poetries, I think we have to understand Caribbean people, right? And so really quickly, I'm just going to throw some definitions at you. Um, when we talk about Caribbean people, we're talking about people born in or inhabitants of the Caribbean regions. Um, people who are Caribbean descent living outside of the Caribbean. And so, like I was saying, this is Caribbean American Heritage Month. So we're looking at um, the ways in which we are all connected through culture, right? Um, and part of that culture is this artistry, is this form of storytelling. Um, when we discuss countries of the Caribbean um, or its people and its inhabitants, we're oftentimes looking at several regions um, that are shared by distinct colonial histories, right, that affected national identities, languages, and shared cultural histories and tides, right? So ultimately, when we think about Caribbean writers, when we think about Caribbean poetry, Caribbean literature, we're also thinking about these writers and these places um, who share this, this linkage of a colonial history, right? We're talking about um, empires here. We are talking about um, the slave trade. Um, we are talking about imperialism, right? And so we are talking about people. We are talking about um, specifically as, as we turn to Grace Nichols, but black folks um, across the diaspora who survived in spite of, right? And that's where that resistance is. So when we look at the history of Caribbean people and literature produced by Caribbean writers, we're looking at Caribbean territories, um, no matter the language, right? Right now we're, we're focused in English, but I have to always um, remind us that the Caribbean is a large place. And so we're talking about languages such as Spanish and Dutch and Hindu um, and, and many other languages, right? Um, numerous Creole languages. I, I, a lot of my studies in poetry um, looks at Creole languages in the Caribbean. Um, and what that means is, is language that has not been um, colonized, right? <laughs> or, or in some form, it's it's the reclamation. Um, that's why I, I named this three-part series um, Resistances and Reclamations. Um, it's the way that we have claimed our own identities um, in spite of or despite it all, right? Um, and so to share the words of Stuart Hall, who is a Caribbean sociologist, he best describes this by saying, Caribbean literature speaks to two worlds that of the Caribbean, of the contemporary Caribbean made by those who presently inhabit it, as well as societies that once conquered these lands and incepted this clash of diasporic identities. Okay, so we're, li we're talking about this heaviness, right? We're talking about um, understanding the history in order to understand the literature of these people. So that's why I wanted to do uh, a very, very brief breakdown that, that ultimately leads us into what I have on the screen, which is some major themes in Caribbean storytelling, okay? So we're talking about um, exile. We're talking about returning to home, right? Um, we're talking about the relationship of language um, to the nation, uh, to people. We're talking about dialect. That's where we can also um, intermingle this idea of creolized languages, right? Languages that we have made our own. Um, we're talking about colonialism and post-colonialism and neo-colonialism. We're also talking about um, self-determination. I think that falls in line with resistance. Um, we're talking about liberty, uh, racial identity, language, power structures, and geographic place. All of these things often show up in Caribbean uh, literature and Caribbean poetry. And so I think I've done quite a, enough talking right now. And I, I want to introduce us um, to Grace Nichols um, and one of her poems called Out of Africa. Um, and I wanna ask if someone tuned in can read this uh, for us. But before I ask someone to read it, um, I, I wanna say really quickly that Grace Nichols is a Guyanese poet. She was born in Guyana, Georgetown, Guyana, which is uh, the capital and also where I'm from in 1950. Um, she also moved to the UK. She moved to England in 1977. 
Um, and her work itself um, has been central to our understanding of the importance um, in the cultural Caribbean British landscape um, for decades, right? Um, so I turn to her um, because she is a, a, a large figure in Caribbean poetry. And so if, for those of you who said that you have not been familiar with any um, Caribbean poets prior to this, I hope that you will um, leave not only knowing her name, but knowing that she has a body of work out there that you can Google, and that will ultimately lead you to other poets such as Derek Walcott, um, we have uh, Campbell Brathway, we have, you know, so many, so many infinite uh, names out there. Um, Lorna Goodes that you can, you can really just point to and hopefully will help inform your own studies of poetry going forward. Um, so now I wanna ask if anyone uh, wants to turn their mic on and read this poem for us. And as we do, I want us to think a little bit more about what's going on. Okay, I want us to be able to talk about this poem. Um, and again, you don't have to have any uh, poetic license to know exactly the function of each line or anything like that. I want us to just think about what's coming to our mind, whether it's imagery, whether it's repetition, or just anything that we can place that this poet does. So would anyone like to read this poem for us? I'll go ahead and read it. Out of Africa of the suckling, out of Africa of the tired woman in earrings, out of Africa of the black foot leap, out of Africa of the baobu bath, the suck teeth, out of Africa, the dry maw of hunger, out of Africa of the first rains, the first mother, into the Caribbean of the staggering blue sea, into the Caribbean of the playful touristy glare, into the Caribbean of the hurricane, into the Caribbean of the blue of the flame tree, the palm tree, the ackee, the high smelling uh, saltfish, and the happy Creole so called mentality, into England of the frost and the tea, into England of the budgie and the strawberry, into England of the trampled autumn tongues into England of the majorie funerals, into England of the hand of the old woman and the gent running behind someone who's forgotten their umbrella crying out, I say, I say, hey. Thank you so much for reading that for me, Charles, and reading that for us, Charles. Um, I want to first ask, What's going on in this poem? Is there, while you were reading it, Charles, what, did you feel anything? What did it make you feel? Or what were some words or, or phrases or lines that really stuck out to you as you were reading it? As I was reading it, it sounded as though she was traveling from Africa to the Caribbean, to, the, to England. And she was describing how uh, each setting uh, made her feel. Um, and the, just the environment that was, she was in and what she like she just gave different senses like she smelled the uh, salt fish um mm. she could see the blue sea in the caribbean and i just it was very descriptive of each place she went pretty much thank you i love i love everything you just said um the first point you made about this idea of travel i think that really shows up right um, that's something that is so noticeable because we have Africa, we have Caribbean, and we have England. You know, that made me think about the intentionality um, behind geography, right? Because she starts out very broadly talking about Africa, right? She goes out of Africa, and Africa could be any country, um, but she says it continentally. And then she says into the Caribbean, right? So we get a more regional focus, but then we go straight into England. You know, we have a specific destination where she lands. And I think that's something um, worth looking at, worth paying attention to. So you're absolutely right about this idea of travel. Um, another thing that I like that you said was this feeling that she got, right? 
this feeling that emerges um, just from the sense of description, right? Um, the way that she uses the senses. Um, uh, we see observation, the tired woman in the earrings, but we also hear things like the black foot leap, right? She makes us um, seem as though we're there with her in those travels, right? Um, what about anyone else? What about Kyra and Swiss? What are some things that you notice um, about this, this poem? And nothing is too obvious. I noticed that the rep there's heavy repetition of into and out of um, there seems to be um, more specificity as we funnel down into England. Yeah, absolutely, Swiss. Um, you know, that was the first thing I thought of, right? This repetition of language, right? And I want to be clear that when we talk about repetition, repetition can show up um, in words, in phrases, in sounds, right? It can also show up visually on the page. Um, we see that the first two uh, stanzas are six lines each, you know, that is a pattern, that's a structure that repeats itself. Um, but also, like Swiss says, the out of, the into, the into, so those are verbal repetitions, right, which is deliberate. I also like how the first um, stanza continues to be out of, out of, out of, and then we get um, the second stanza, and we get the into, the into, and then the final two lines, don't follow that pattern, right? And then when we get to the third stanza, it's into, into, and then the final three lines don't um, follow that pattern. So one of the things that we think about, um, that I like to think about what makes an effective poem um, is that element of, uh, we can call it an element of surprise, but but to me, it's it's not really, it's a surprise to readers, not to the writers, right? Um, it is that deliberate breakage of a pattern being um, done over and over and over again. And I think that Grace Nichols uh, does that well. So we see that, that um, repetition, but it's also the way that that repetition um, out of is also held in comparison or juxtaposition against the phrase into, right? So I like to think that's also very intentional in the writer because she could have written anything. It could have been out of, out of, out of, and then she could have said, uh, with her, with her, with her. But I think that deliberate um, juxtaposition makes us focus a little bit more on what you said, Charles, about uh, geography, right? About this, uh, this person, the speaker's um, connection to the global world, um, which is something that I think uh, she does really well. The last thing I want to point out, because I want to make sure that we can spend some time doing our own writing, is that I think this poem leaves us on and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, right? But we, we talked a little bit about imagery and I think this poem leaves us on a, on this image that is hard to get rid of, right? Um, which is in the last three breakaway lines and the gent running behind someone who's forgotten their umbrella crying out, I say, I say, hey. It seems as though we have this very um, savior image going on here. And so when I think about um, what's going on in this poem. And I think about it structurally, right? Which is the technical aspect of it. And I think about it alongside um, the content of it, right? Which is what exactly is the intention of this poem? I'm thinking a little bit about what is that long lasting image that's in our head? So what, what do you guys make of the final three lines? What is the image um, generally that this poem uh, might've gave you at the beginning versus at the end? What do you, what do you guys feel and there are no no right or wrong answers it's really about interpretation i quite literally just like picture a guy running after her i guess and like hey you leave either literally or like figuratively like you forgot your umbrella like mm -hmm. i don't know that's what i see i can like almost picture that. Definitely. What about Swiss and Cairo? What do you guys see and how do you interpret that? Because I see the same thing that, that you see, Charles, but I also, when I think about the connection to all of these lands and places, I, I have to also wonder, 
you know, why it is that this poet chooses to, to land us on this image with someone um, deliberately handing someone else something, right? Out of, out of goodwill or good fortune or whatever you wanna call it. Um, so I think that the whole poem is like a journey. So it's about somebody taking a journey, but also the reader is taking a journey while reading it. So you're going out of something and then into something. And then I guess going into that next place may then involve somebody helping you and somebody giving you a helping hand to then go on to whatever is next. If the pattern continues, that's in the poem, into, into, then it's like, okay, so in order to get into this next place, there's some gent who's coming up, as you mentioned, like as a savior to help somebody that's, you know, that obviously needs something that um, is supposed to like prepare them for whatever is left um, of their journey that they're going on or if their journey ends there. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I think that's perfect. And I, I always wish we can spend more time actually looking at the lines um, of a poem because to be honest, we could talk about this poem for over an hour, right? Um, but when I, when I think about this poem and I, I think about what's going on uh, in here, um, you know, I have to think about lines that that stick out to me, right? And even in that stanza alone, I think about this idea of trampled autumn tongues, right? Um, which to me leads us back to, to language, right? Um, that's met with this idea of, of uh, a meager funeral, you know? Um, and then we're left with this, this idea also of, of um, uh, an old woman and, and a gent running behind her. And, and so I'm thinking about what is the correlation between those images, right? That I think are very deliberate and very intentional. And I don't, I don't think that either of us um, are, are wrong here. I think exactly what you said as well, Kyra, and, and you as well, Charles. Um, but I think that after reading this several times, we can honestly come together and, and have several interpretations um, as far as we talk, uh, as far as we can talk about this idea of travel, as we can talk about this idea of transnationalism, what it means to belong to a place or even call a place ours, what it means um, to, to travel from these places that are also connected historically um, due to, to a certain uh, violence, right? Um, so, so I think there are so many strings to pull from here, but what I really wanted us to do is make sure that we can understand the ways um, that a poem functions, both in the outside world, but, but also on a very um, intricate line to line level. And so what that means is I want us to get into a habit of, of writing with some kind of, of um, some kind of goal in mind, I'll say that. I, I don't wanna say that there has to be this um, structure, although I, I will say even the poems we think are not structured are structured in that way that they're not, right? <laughs> it's, it's so meta. Um, but I want us to really think for the purposes of this workshop, um, to think a lot about form and to think about content, right? Um, why? Because that that allows us to see what Grace Nichols is doing on a very um, stylistic level and allows us to, to add to our own bank, right, of, of how it is that we can go ahead and even edit our own poems after we've um, written them in whatever fashion we've decided to write them, whether it is um, through just listening and recording ourselves or whether that is handwriting it. Um, so really quickly, I want us, and we'll do this as a group um, at, at first and, and we'll, we'll make some, a little bit of time for it. Um, but I want us to think of a, re a repetitive word or phrase, right? And once we have that, I want us to add it to the beginning or the end of whatever line, right? And the only way we could do that is by making sure that we have um, some independent or, or dependent clauses. And then I want us to end the poem by disrupting this pattern, right? And so that's the technique that we're going to work on. Um, but at the same time, simultaneously, we're also gonna think about content. So when we do so, we're thinking about a larger theme, right? And, and I want you to really hold on to this for when you're writing, um, you're doing some independent writing on your own. But I want us to think about a theme. So we all said that we, we felt um, 
um, that, that theme of either migration or travel um, in Grace Nichols' poem. And so I want us to think about a, a theme um, for our poem together. And we wanna ask ourselves um, in our mind, what is this poem doing? Like what, what purpose does it serve in this world again, right? How it is that we write for reason, right? And, and that's what I like to think when I think about uh, writing as a form of resistance. We're talking about writing for reason, right? Um, and I want us to just be creative. I want us to have fun, you know? So this first step is just us playing around, um, putting our thoughts out there. And in case anyone was like, I don't know what you're talking about, I have an example. <laughs> and so for the sake of time, um, I think that we can skip my example and we can go ahead and do something together. Um, and if you're looking at this right now while I'm talking, all you see is exactly what, what I was expressing to you. So I just picked, I am here, I am here, I'm here. Um, and you see some derivatives there with I am here, the question mark, and then ending in I think I am here, which changes up that whole attitude, right? Um, which are attached um, to independent and dependent clauses. And, you know, I can always um, share this PowerPoint presentation with you guys afterwards. If that's something that you would like, um, I'll go ahead and I can, I can put the link in the chat um, at the end of this, as long as someone reminds me, okay? So what I want us to do really quickly is I would like for you to possibly unmute yourself or use the chat, whichever, whichever one you uh, prefer. And I want us to, to think of um, a phrase or a word that we'd like to repeat. And at this point, um, whoever unmutes themselves first to say something will go with that. Um, beginning stride. Okay. <laughs> someone, someone, it's in the chat. It's not me. So someone said, um, stride in the beginning. So what I would ask us to do is I would ask us to, um, go ahead and fill in at least the first, however, two, three, four, um, lines with strive. Oh, sorry. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep that consistent, right? Um, so if you guys want to go ahead and create this chart, um, you'll fill in the beginning with stride. And so that means that I'm gonna ask each one of us to come up with a dependent or independent clause. Um, so since Kyra, I believe that was Kyra uh, that said stride, could you go ahead and uh, say the first line? Um, so again, it has to start with try, and then you want to attach a dependent or independent clause. And we'll go back to my example for those of you who might not be sure um, what the dependent or independent clause means. All it means is an independent clause is a statement that can stand on its own, right? Um, it is a full sentence. Um, and so you can go ahead and, and add that. Or a dependent clause is something that cannot stand on its own because then it would be an incomplete sentence, okay? So that's all we're doing. We're going to go ahead and we're gonna add a dependent or independent clause um, and attach it to the beginning word striving. All right, uh, we could do something like when the going gets tough. Okay, striving when the going gets tough. I like that. Who would like to add on to that? Striving when the going gets tough, do not give up. Oh, I like that. Okay, so let's see. Striving when the going gets tough, striving. So then it would be uh, striving, do not give up. Striving when the going gets tough, striving, do not give up. Is that, is that? Yes, is that right? Yeah. Okay, then I would say striving means I'm not alone. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> that <was> Thank good. <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, if Swiss is still here, would you like to throw in a, a line for us? Let's, can we write this in the chat, striving? Um, Kyra, can you put your line and then Charles, can you put your line and then I'll put mine? All right, I got you. Striving. When the going gets tough. All right, I got mine. Okay, and then Charles, you can put yours. 
Okay. And so essentially we have three lines. That could be our first stance and we can keep it going. Um, what I am going to ask us to do is that we're going to find some kind of alteration, right? So if we're going to keep the word striving. By the time we get to either our final lines or our final stanza, I'm going to ask us to alter it, right? So maybe we decide to get rid of the word striving. Maybe our final lines is just do not give up, right? Or maybe the final lines is... Um, going gets tough. Again, it's, it, it could be a fragment, right? Or maybe our final lines is actually the opposite of striving, right? Um, so, so we're thinking a little bit about um, that intentionality. Again, what it is that we are trying to, to go for here. What is our aim? What is our purpose of this poem? Um, so this was really just an example. What I want us or what I want you guys to do is really to just have, you know, the next five, six minutes at least. Um, I know we, we had a little bit of technical trouble, um, but the next five minutes to really just come up with at least a stanza, right? I don't think we're, any of us are gonna walk away with a full um, fledged poem. And even if we did, it, it would still be a draft. So all I ask is that, you know, we can produce at least our first stanza in the next, um, it, and it does, it could be a, a couple of, of lines that we might throw away later. Um, but if we could do so for the next five to six minutes, um, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and I'll come back um, in the next five or six minutes. And then hopefully we can share whatever lines we have.
How's everyone doing? Feel free to check in in the chat. Um, throw some lines in there. I realize we have some extra time so we can keep writing for another 10 minutes or so. Um, but please, please check in with me. Let me know how you're doing and you can do so via chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah,
Hey, hey, I see in the chat that Charles is ready to share. Kyra and Swish just checking in. Need a two, three more minutes or what we looking like? Okay, great. I just checked the chat. I see that we are ready to share. Again, this is just a reminder that this is in no way a final draft. I want to thank you so much for joining me today in this workshop. I hope that at least you will walk away with some lines that you really love, whether you see yourself incorporating it in a poem that you've already written, or you see yourself writing something later tonight or this week. I'm very happy for this part of our short, again, very introductory workshop where you guys get to share some of your own poetry that you've written today. So. How about we do the order in the chat? Charles, are you fine with going first and then Swiss and then Kyra? How does that sound? Sounds good. Great, yay. Okay, so whenever you're ready, the floor is all yours. I do not mind. I do not mind sophisticated. I do not mind thoughtful. I do not mind driven. Reasons I do not mind spending time. Oh, the possibilities. I do not mind sophisticated. I do not mind thoughtful. I do not mind driven. Oh, so fine. I do not mind. I do not mind spending time. Oh, the possibilities. The possibilities are endless. That's it. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for sharing. First of all, first of all, we have to talk about how you created a whole refrain, okay? You know, you went a step further than just um, doing a single word or a single phrase, but I heard a repetition of a, a stanza in there, right? Um, or a collection of lines, at least, am I, am I right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And so that refrain does not go unnoticed. Um, I want to commend you for doing that. Um, you know, one of the things that I have to say is that, and I, I keep saying this is a very intro, uh, introductory workshop, um, because what I want us to do um, is that whether or not you go out and use these lines, when you think about your own techniques for poetry, right, it is about this assembly of everything that we've learned and everything that we feel. And so I hope that you will go on to use that refrain or, or you know, push yourself into writing more refrains um, and then collectively thinking or simultaneously thinking um, about ways, like we talked about earlier, how to break those um, those kind of expectations. And I see you leaning towards that, um, you know, metaphorically, of course, <laughs> because all your cameras are off, but I see you leaning <laughs> towards that um, in your writing. And, and, you know, I would ask what you mentioned um, in Great, Grace Nichols' uh, poetry, which is that sensory element, right? Now, how is it that you can use those lines to make us, um, feel those emotions, those, uh, whether it's, it's thinking, um, or, or the other, um, adjectives, uh, verbs that, that you've used. I want to think about ways, um, I want you to think about ways that you can also use sensory images to make us feel that as well, right? Like feel that alongside the speaker as well. I commend you so much. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And I hope that you're inspired to keep writing, whether it's that poem or to write more. Absolutely. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Swiss. You're up next. Kyra, you're on deck. I am not. I am not the rawness of remembered mistakes. I am not the lost time I've misplaced. I am not the displaced anger I've given so freely. I am not the darkness that consumed me gleefully. I am not gleeful as she would have hoped, though I am whole. Oh my gosh, first of all, 
You know, one thing that I love um, is the fact that I am not, the phrase that you decide to use <laughs> is in itself a, a complete thought. So when you said that, I was like, are you responding to me? Are you not next? But it is a full thought. And so as you elongated that thought on each line, um, it built on each other, right? It was a progression um, that led us to the full humanity of this speaker. And so I think that was such a phenomenal job. I, I'd love to see where that poem goes, Swiss. Thank you. You're welcome. And Kyra. All right, let's see what we got here. You will, <clears throat> oh, so, excuse me, let me try that again. All right. We will undergo hardships our ancestors already felt. We will experience the good and bad experiences time continues to tell. We will surpass all expectations. They will wish they set the bar higher. We will see the better world for our kids that we desire. We will not throw in the towel. We will not cut ourselves short. We will go out fighting as our last resort. They will regret not giving us a fighting chance. We will fight and fight. They don't stand a chance. They did, so we will. Oh, thank you. That is, first of all, you guys have these complete poems. I came up with the thought, I did not ask for this. And I wrote about two lines. And so thank you so much for sharing that, Kyra. Oh my goodness. I hope that you will also continue that poem and or write uh, a sibling poem for that poem. <laughs> I think that would be interesting. And so I wanna thank you guys again for your time, um, for your commitment to poetry, for your creativity. Um, this is a time for me to, to plug myself. Um, you can go ahead and follow my literary Instagram page at what you read in this series on Instagram. Um, you'll see future updates there in terms of forthcoming um, workshops, events, everything that's going on this week, um, uh, everything that's going on this month. Um, this is a reminder that this is the first of three event series next Wednesday at the same time that is 5.30 Central, 6.30 Eastern. Uh, we will be having a poetry reading. You do not want to miss that. It is, it's gonna bring a lot of joy, I think, into this space. Um, and then we are going to end uh, this event series with a, a discussion um, that is entitled um, Embodied Ethnography, Identity and Resistance. And it is um, a conversation that I'm going to have with one of my sister scholars um, and, and her family member, actually. Um, I see someone is entering this room, but we are about to close out. <laughs> so what I want to do is, is ask you guys to, to check that out. But also, um, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself or write in the chat and plug anything that you've got going on this week, this month, or something that we can tune into, I'd love to, to make space for that. I don't have anything to plug. However, thank you for allowing me to share my poetry and just I've learned a lot just in this little session. Um, so thank you, Carmen, and thank you, Fox and Swift, for sharing as well. Yeah, I don't have anything to plug either, but thank you, Carmen, for this series. And uh, thank you all for sharing. Um, I think this was a wonderful workshop, and I'm just proud to have been a part of it. Thank you guys. Okay, thank you so, 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 so much. It would not be a workshop without anyone tuning in, okay? So thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.